Welcome, everyone. My name is Vianet Castellanos, and I'm the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. For access purposes, I'm a brown-skinned woman with dark hair, wearing glasses with black frames, and a brown dress with blue flowers. The University of Minnesota IAS Thursday series brings together scholars, artists, and community leaders to discuss the most pressing issues of our time. For the next two years, we focus um, uh, on the theme of injustice. Our featured guests will offer different lenses to approach today's problems, explore their own visions for what justice might look like, and together we'll gain a deeper understanding of how to build a better future and a more just world. Today's event, Hip Hop at 50, New Perspectives, Alternative Genealogies, is the first of our fall 2023 series and is presented with the Department of American Studies. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to start off our year with this event. Um, it's just very thrilling to have you all here today. All IAS public events, including this one, include professional captioning. You can do captions by clicking the string text link shared via the chat or by clicking the show captions button on Zoom's menu. We'll be using Slido to facilitate our, our audience Q&A today. Attendees can use their smartphones and scan the QR code displayed on screen or go to www.slido.com and enter the code HIPHOP. Please note that questions can be submitted anonymously. We encourage you to upvote previously submitted questions to ensure we address questions based on audience interest priority. Please know that in order to respond to as many questions as possible, we may occasionally combine related questions. My next step in welcoming you today is to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the ancestral and contemporary lands of Dakota people, and that the University of Minnesota was not only built on unceded Dakota land, but built with the profits from selling thousands of acres of Dakota and Anishinaabe land. At the IAS, we see the work of supporting communities of color as inseparable from supporting our indigenous relatives and colleagues. Toward that end, it's important to acknowledge and denounce historic and contemporary forms of racial injustice in the city where we work as well. So I begin by standing in solidarity with the families of George Floyd, Dante Wright, Jamar Clark, and Philando Castile, and many others whose loved ones have been killed by police violence in Minnesota. As a scholar whose work critically examines racial injustice, I support the sovereignty of our indigenous relatives while advancing the IS's commitment to building an anti-racist and inclusive university that disavows white supremacy and racism. This semester is part of our Injustice series. We'll be hosting several conversations featuring indigenous scholars. In the months to come, we will discuss how indigenous knowledge-keeping systems appear in the archives, and our annual Thinking Spatially Symposium is dedicated entirely to the subject of indigenous data sovereignty. As you join us at these coming events, I hope you will see how these events act as just one way, one way we have committed to working alongside our relatives to dismantle the systems that seek to do harm, to sharing power, and to building a just university together. And finally, if you'll allow one final message before I pass the microphone to my colleague to begin tonight's program, um, our next event also features an array of esteemed mus musicians. So please join us back here online or here in person on Thursday, September 28th for the Black History of Jazz featuring Ayodele Cassell, critically acclaimed tap dancer and choreographer, alongside Professor Elliot Powell and Michael Gullipay, discussing the African roots of jazz and tap. And now, without further delay, I am very pleased to introduce my colleague, today's moderator, moderator, Dr. Elliot Powell. Dr. Powell is Beverly and Richard Fink Professor in Liberal Arts, Associate Professor of American Studies and Asian American Studies, and Affiliate Faculty in the Department of African American and African Studies and Department of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Minnesota. He is the author of Sounds from the Other Side, Afro-South Asian Collaborations and Black Popular Music, which is a terrific book and at work on two projects tentatively titled Friends, Porn, and Public Sex, which explores the politics of sexuality and music in Minneapolis during the 1980s, and Illegitimate Sounds, which explores the queer potentiality of recordings like demos that do not conform to commercial audio legibility. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. So thank you so much, Bianette, for that introduction. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Um, I again want to thank really IAS, the Department of Theater, Arts, and Dance, 
the Department of Cultural Studies and Comparative Literature, the African American and African Studies Department, and the School of Music for co-sponsoring this event tonight. Uh, and I especially want to thank Abby and Carolina and Tamara for all of their hard work around really sort of the logistics for this event. Uh, so uh, I have really the honor and the deep privilege of introducing the speakers for tonight, as well as moderating the event. Really, so the tonight's speakers are not only really renowned hip hop scholars, uh, but they're also friends of mine who I've known for several years. Um, and so really before this event even started, we were just talking about all things music related, all things work related. Uh, and it's, it's really um, like a kind of reunion, I think, of sorts for all of us. Um, and so it's really great to, for me to be in conversation and I'm so lucky to be in conversation with them. Uh, and so I want to really sort of start by introducing our speakers uh, for tonight. So Dr. Imani Kai Johnson is an interdisciplinary scholar specializing in the African diaspora, hip hop, dance, as well as structures of power. She's currently very much an associate professor of critical dance studies uh, in, in the Department of Black Study at UC Riverside. She's the author of Dark Matter and Breaking Ciphers, The Life of Africanist Sort of Aesthetics and Global Hip Hop, which was published by Oxford University Press this year. This book explores the unseen or invisibilized Africanist Sort of Aesthetics embedded in the ritual dance circle called the Cipher. Dr. Johnson, Dr. Johnson has also co-edited the Oxford Handbook of Hip Hop Dance Studies, which was published this year, and is the founder and artistic director of the Show Improve Hip Hop Studies Conference series. Next, we have really sort of Dr. Jessica Pabon Colon, who's an associate professor of women's gender and sexuality studies at SUNY New Paltz. She's currently a member at large for the National Women's Studies Association and the secretary for the Puerto Rican Studies Association. Her first book, which is first book, which is entitled Sort of Graffiti Girls Performing Feminism in the Hip Hop Diaspora, published by NYU Press in 2018, is the first academic study on women's participation within hip hop graffiti art subculture. Her essays have appeared in Frontiers, Signs, and Women of Performance, Theater History Studies, and TDR. She's currently working on a new on an on a new kind of anthology, and it's an interdisciplinary it's it's an interdisciplinary uh, uh, project that's called Rican Feminisms, which will chart the terrain of Puerto Rican feminisms of the past, present, and future. Dr. Lauren Carer uh, is very much an assistant professor of ethnomusicology and musicology in the Irving S. Gilmore School of Music at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo, Michigan, where they teach courses in popular music and global music cultures and Western art music. The research focuses on the intersections of race, gender, and sexuality in American popular music and especially hip hop. They have published articles in American Music in the Journal of the Society for American Music, Popular Music and Society in the Journal of Popular Music Studies. I'm going to pause right here to say that Lauren has a great essay on really New Orleans uh, and, 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 um, and, and really sort of this, this sort of dance genre and culture called Sissy Bounds uh, that you all should really check out. It is part of our new issue in the Journal of Popular Music Studies. I say, new, I, I say our because I co-edit that journal. Um, so I'm really excited to have Lauren's work there as well. Their first book, titled Queer Voices in Hip Hop, Cultures, Cultures and Communities in Contemporary Performance, which is published with the University of Michigan Press in 2022, examines the work of Black queer and trans artists in hip hop. They're currently co-editing the volume with Stephanie Jensen Malton called Better Be Good to Me. Uh, the subheading is Africa, sorry, sorry, subheading is American popular songs as domestic violence narratives, which is under contract with the University of Michigan Press. Lastly, Dr. Shante Paradigm Smalls is a scholar, artist, and writer. They focus on Black popular culture and music, film, and visual art, uh, as well as genre fiction and other sets of aesthetic forms. Their first book, the first book, which is titled Hip Hop Heresies, Queer, uh, sorry, for, Hip Hop Heresies, Queer, Queer um, Aesthetics in New York City was published by NYU Press in June of 2022. And it won the 2016 Clags Fellowship Award for Best Manuscript in LGBTQ Studies, the 2002, 2000, got a shout out there, the 2002, 2000, and, the two, sorry, sorry, 2022, 2023 New York City Book Award from, from, from the New York, New York Society Library. Uh, they, also, they, they also received a special uh, mention for the 2023 uh, uh, for the 2023 Amayas from Book Prize uh, and has also been shortlisted for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's Book Prize. Yeah, doing the thing. 
And we love Francesca Royster. <laughs> yes. Yes. Do, yes. Very much shout out to, to, to really sort of Francesca Royster as well, who's, whose work we all very much admire. Uh, really sort of Dr. Small's writing has appeared in The Arrow and QED and The Black Scholar and GLQ, as well as women performance and criticism, lateral American behavioral scientists, suspect thoughts, syndicate literature, and the feminist presses, queer and now uh, series, uh, as well as the Oxford Handbook of Queerness and Music. Music, excuse me. And then really sort of Dr. Small is an associate professor in the Department of Art and Public Policy at really NYU, uh, which is how we met. Uh, as grad students at NYU, as long as, as 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 well as with Jess as well, for all kind of NYU kind of you know sort of grad students who now on this stage together, right? Um, they've also held positions at St. John's University and Everett University of New Mexico and Davidson College. So really, to get things started, um, I've asked all the speakers today if they could first speak for about seven to ten minutes addressing a central question. The central question is this, as we really reflect on the 50 years of hip hop, how does your work help us understand something new or something different or something otherwise about hip hop? So that's the question that I'm gonna pose to them. They'll speak for about seven to 10 minutes. Um, and then after they respond to this question, we're gonna have a more broader kind of conversation that I'll moderate uh, that's gonna be really sort of amongst ourselves. And then during the last probably 30 minutes of this event, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So let's start with Dr. Amani Kai Johnson to really sort of start things off with us. You have the floor. Thank you again. It's an idea to see the lesson helps me. Greetings all. Um, thank you for having me and inviting me, Elliot. And um, yeah, seven, 10 minutes. I'm trying not to think about that as a pressure way. So um, may or may not wrap up a little bit early. Um, so in terms of the new, the different, and the otherwise. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So um, my main work is the book, Dark Matter and Breaking Ciphers, The Life of African Aesthetics and Global Hip Hop. It started as my dissertation. And ultimately it began as a project um, that sought to understand the ritual circle in the African diaspora. Um, coming out of research in my master's where I was looking at African diasporic ritual cultures and I landed on carnival and I was thinking about elements of spirit and presentation and um, I, I was seeing overlap with hip hop. I was taking all kinds of classes with the late, brilliant Kamal Brathwaite and I was reading Trisha Rose's Black Noise. Both of those were firsts for me simultaneously. And so my relationship to hip hop was just, it was a, it was, I grew up with it. I consider myself among that first generation for whom there was no pop culture without hip hop already in it. Um, so to realize I can study it and not realize it until really grad school uh, was exciting. But when I went to, you know, writing my little chapter comparing hip hop and carnival, and I was like, I just wanted to reference ciphers and everything I went to find, uh, just a quick citation, there was no discussion of ciphering. And I remember calling my friend Ted and being like, I didn't make this word up, right? This is a thing. This is a thing, right? And he was like, yes, you didn't. You didn't make it up. It is a thing. Nobody's writing about it. And I was also taking classes looking at African cultures and the Americas. And everybody mentions, talks about names, things happening in circles. And nobody spent time really talking about why it was kind of ubiquitous, but taking them for granted. And so coming out of the master's, I really wanted to write about a ritual that I understood from experience and had a relationship to, but wanted to understand more deeply. And um, I didn't want this to be the project because I didn't know anybody. And I was like, this will be my second project after tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and then like every paper I wrote in grad school in my PhD was like, a semester's worth of interest and I was done. So I committed to the project. Once I gave myself permission to really write about where my interests were, which was in dance, because I've always loved dance and I've been a social dancer my whole life, um, that opened up a whole lot of room. And my questions started off rather basic, like why are there circles everywhere? And what does the circle form? And I was, it was very kind of surface questions, but of interest. And by the end of the project, I realized that it was about Africanist aesthetics. It was about these kind of inherited 
aesthetics that I consider part of the Black radical tradition that get activated in different cultural forms and expressions by people of African descent in the world um, to create space for them for, for survival, for liberation, for freedom, for connection, for healing and redress. And the circle is a structure, but it's also a concept. So even if the structure isn't there, conceptually, there are elements of that circle that matter. And what came to really be for me is that people's relationship to breaking to hip hop, for a lot of people, it's not just some kind of surface fad thing that you jump in and jump out of when you get older, but it shaped their worlds, it shaped their lives. And they were learning things in the context of the circle um, about how to be in the world. And to me, those lessons weren't simply about hip hop. Those lessons were named hip hop, but they were embedded in Africanist aesthetic. They were embedded in a practice of circling up in a practice where you are expected to bring some aspect of yourself. You are not expected to take part and be like everybody else. You're expected to take part and bring who you are to that space, but in a way that is respectful of some of the underlying codes and sensibilities that you learn in the practice of participating. So some of that is bring your originality. Some of that is a capacity to improvise, but that means you're also listening to the music and the structure within which you're improvising. It also, you know, so there was all these kinds of elements that are in African aesthetics that you see in all kinds of African diasporic practices, even as they take shape in slightly different ways in those forms. Um, and I wanted to spend time on that. So for my first chapter, which is the main carryover from the dissertation, I looked at hip hop ciphers in relationship to um, African-American ring shout traditions. So a tradition of circling up and conversion practices within African-American culture. Um, Puerto Rican street boom bus circles. So of the African diaspora still thinking about the circle and dance and music and all of those relationships, those dynamics. And Brazilian capoeira hora, so martial art. But breaking is also referred to as, you know, a combat art. And so you can see elements of all of these things within a breaking circle because there's so much shared. Call and response is a, you know, fundamentally shared thing across all of these practices. Uh, uh, the dynamic with music, talking about bomba gave room to really talk about, in because in a bomba context, the dancer is the conductor. The dancer is creating the rhythm and the drummers are responding. So there's you understand the dynamic there in a different way than the way we see hip hop as if, you know, everybody's seen a circle, but they don't necessarily know what they're looking at, especially when it's reduced to a visual medium. It's not just a spectacle. There is a dynamic with the music, with the DJ, with the other dancers, with oneself and a relationship to the ground. And if all you expect is a show in front of your face, you're missing layers of information and dynamics that matter and that all often come back to spirit spirit of the community, spirit of the person, spiritual connection to ancestors. And breakers talk about all of those things. They don't talk about it in the exact same way. They don't necessarily say, oh, I had a relationship with my ancestors in the circle. What they'll say is I was breaking and I can see my boy this and my friend this who passed away or who were no longer with us. And so there are these dynamics that I think we don't recognize in hip hop because our relationship to the culture is reduced to a kind of commodity driven pop culture that is visual and it, that's it and that's really about a capitalist and a western kind of ideological framework attached to this thing that's operating in all kinds of other ways and for me it was important to draw out not only name those Africanist aesthetics bring them out of a certain kind of invisibilization but also acknowledge then that one does not have to be of the African diaspora or di identify with or through the African diaspora or blackness to have a relationship to these aesthetics. And in fact, in the U.S. context, virtually most of our pop cultural music phenomena and dance have a relationship to the diaspora. So you've all learned these aesthetics. You all have a relationship to them. And when they go unnamed, we're allowed to pretend like it's some siloed separate thing over there that we can ignore. And that's so basically um, I wanted to draw out and figure out a way to talk to the multiple audiences who either do have or want to have a relationship to these cultures to recognize and start to articulate, you also then have a relationship to Blackness, which then opens up the door to thinking about what is your responsibility then if this is something you're committed, committed to. Um, so the book spends time and, and spends time really thinking through the oral histories of dancers and putting their words in conversation with my questions and scholarship available to um, 
think about what those aesthetics are, what they're actually doing in those spaces, how people are activating them, how it shapes their worldviews, how it shapes their sense of self, their relationship to others, and how it shapes and helps to facilitate a global hip hop. Um, and to create space for people to talk about that from their own experiences without it being like, oh, because the, the assumption used to be like, oh, if you're saying it's Black, then you're saying that I can't be involved. And that's not what I'm saying. So I wanted to create room in the scholarship and in the culture for people to, yes, acknowledge that and to be involved. And then that opens up a whole new set of questions about what that involvement means and looks like. Is that a good start? <laughs> yeah so thank you so much um for that we're, we're, we're lots of lots of things lots of questions uh i know that i have and i know that you all have but like i said we're going to continue to kind of go down a particular line with everyone doing um to, to answer that first question and then and then we're going to have a conversation so actually jess yes thank you so much thanks for everybody for coming in thanks folks for logging in um I wrote my thing down because I talk too much. So I'm going to read to you, but hopefully in an engaging way. Under a cloudless sky on a bright sunny day, six graffiti writers step up to a freight train car and start tagging. The reggae music playing in the background is punctuated by the clicking of cans, the spraying of aerosol paint, and the very faint sound of shoes moving through gravel. The writers tag their names, fluidly moving from one letter to the next at different rhythms. They stretch their bodies, they get up on tippy toes to get a little higher, they inch to the right as the letters hit the surface. They step away from the freight car in their own time. These are some of the graffiti girls in the Few and Far crew. Neith, an Austin-based stencil artist from Peru, Dime, an Oakland-based Chicana writer and muralist, Wuna, a Montreal-based writer from France, Pollen, a queer writer from Washington, D.C., Isla, a Los Angeles-based writer, and Mimi, the crew's founder, an indigenous graffiti writer and skater from Northern California. At the end of the video, you hear somebody say, yay, before the camera pans to the left and our 30-second peek into the collective ritual is over. We don't get to see their tags or their faces. No one looks at the camera. The focus of the video seems to be about making their collective work visible. They paint together not quite at the same time, not quite in the same way, but with a similar intention of marking the surface, accepting the impermanence of the mark, and breaking the law to claim, I am here. We are here. Today, we are here on Turtle Island in the traditional lands of the Dakota people, a people that survived the violence of European settlers who categorized them as less than human to steal their land and in an effort to erase their lives and their life ways. Our prompt for today was to reflect on 50 years of hip hop and how our work helps people understand something new and something otherwise about the culture. And from my vantage point as a graffiti scholar who teaches, teaches in gender and sexuality studies, when I think of alternative genealogies, I think about what it means that I, a diasporic Puerto Rican woman educated within settler institutions, learn to interrogate what I now understand to be settler colonial logics of heteropatriarchy and private property by paying attention to how graffiti girls reclaim space from corporate America, capitalist property owners, and the cis male dominated subculture within which they practice their art form. I learned what an anti colonial feminist act could look like, what anti colonial feminist collectivity might look like, even when, and maybe most especially when, it's not announced as such. They taught me how to produce alternative ways of being in relation to one another by doing what they do, getting their graffiti up. They painted and I paid attention. Because the way I paid attention was rooted in queer feminist hip hop methodologies, I was able to see how stepping to the wall or the train or the billboard allows graffiti girls to play with gender expression, to defy gender roles, to create what I see as feminist community grounded in solidarity and alliance and coalition. I watched them model for one another the various ways of being and becoming girls, and I'm saying that with two R's and a Z, <laughs> together in real life and in online spaces. I watched 
as they modeled how to perform feminism against a still-present colonial capitalist order that routinely puts us into binaries and hierarchies to divide us along axes of difference. I teach a class on gender and sexuality and hip hop, and we used my book, Graffiti Girls, as the main text, as cringe as that is, by foregrounding hip hop's visual culture instead of sonic and the unlikely subjects around the globe, the girls who produce it. My students are equipped to consistently decenter, contextualize trouble, remix US centric, cis, hetero, masculine defined hip hop culture and white-centered liberal feminism. They develop a much more expansive and critical language to reflect upon and understand both hip-hop culture and feminist movement. That expansive and more complicated narrative also allows students to deviate who deviate from the hip-hop archetype perpetuated by mainstream media to form a closer connection to the culture. And for those students who do not see themselves or their interests represented in mainstream feminism to come closer to feminist movement. The caption on Few and Far's video read, not only are we about that life, we are about opening and holding the door for more women to come in. We are few and far, insert crown emoji, and we are only getting stronger. I woke up this morning and Mimi had posted an image of a work in progress by Lady Pink on the crew's Instagram page. Right? The caption reads, It's a great honor to be recognized and respected by the one and only Lady Pink, our mother of graffiti. We will always cherish this. We greatly appreciate you, Pink, everything you've done for our culture. Pink's painting features her signature brick lady, Standing among other buildings in an urban setting, there are train tracks, a skate ramp, and a wall at the lady's feet. On the wall, Pink painted Mimi's throw up and a few and far tag, alongside a memorial tag to ACB, may she rest in peace. Pink also depicts one of the early New York City writers in action, Charmin 65. She's shown standing at the wall, spray can in hand. By including these girls, Pink reaffirms hip hop culture's commitment to shouting out one's community. And as a highly visible her historical figure in graffiti subculture, Pink uses her position to paint few and far into graffiti history. So I had to go to, you know, Pink's original post to see what was going on over there because it was a repost. And I discovered what can only be described as a graffiti girl love fest. Pink's caption reads, these are details of my latest work, Friendly Neighborhood Brick Lady. I just finished and lovingly added props to people that inspire me. She tagged Mimi and Few and Far writing, a bunch of badass ladies that paint and skate better than most dudes. And listen to these comments. Mimi to Pink, you're one of my biggest inspirations. Queen Andrea, if there's a woman who deserves props for uniting us, it's Mimi. And Erotica 67, Massive respect to Mimi and few and far women. I want to acknowledge that my scholarship is impossible without their persistence. Graffiti girls are the ones getting up. They're the ones going out. They're the ones taking the risks. They don't stop. They keep it moving. And even as my ethnographic research with them is complete, my gratitude to them, my relationship, relationships with some of, some of them, and my attention to them has not faltered. Seeing my comment on her post, Mimi reached out to tell me this morning that next year, so this is kind of a plug for that, they are planning the biggest all-girl painting jam in history. It's going to take place in St. Louis, making sure to tell me that this all-girl event will specifically include trans graffiti girls. We make in history, she wrote. While writing Graffiti Girls, I had the pleasure with working, of working with both Imani and Shantae at different points and for different reasons. Shantae and I co-edited a special issue of Women in Performance titled All Hail the Queen. Shout out Latifa. In our introduction, we claimed our desire for recalibration and shared our concern that the disciplinary boundaries enclosing feminism, hip-hop, and queer would continue to suppress hip-hop's pedagogical, social, aesthetic, and political power, unless scholars were committed to a queer feminist hip-hop praxis. Naming the stakes of our calibration, we argued that, these are quotes, 
The increase in knowledge production attuned to these queer feminist desires has the potential to radically alter how scholars teach hip hop, how students learn hip hop, how practitioners embody and think about their expressive practices, and how society at large values hip hop as not just an aesthetic practice, but a social and political one. That was a full decade ago, Shantae. 2013, Lord, time. In a world where it feels like anti-racist, anti-colonial, feminist, queer, BIPOC politics hardly experience wins, at a time when scholars and educators are in the midst of a great battle over what kinds of knowledge can be valued, shared, and considered necessary, and here, of course, I'm referring to the wave of anti-critical race theory, anti-LGBTQ, and anti-reproductive justice legislation that's gripping the nation, I feel like we have to call our work and our presence here today as something different, something otherwise, and something new. We did it. We recalibrated, and we must claim it. We are here. Thank you. Lauren. Um, thank you, Elliot, for convening us. Uh, this is maybe one of the dopest things I've ever gotten to do in my life, to be honest. Um, and it's partly because, um, I think I can say this, that uh, in terms of our career direct tra trajectories, I'm probably the most junior person on this panel who has deeply, deeply benefited from these folks' work, right? That special issue that I, it came out um, when I was a grad student and shaped how I thought about my work so much. So thank you, all, <laughs> all of you. Um, yeah, you recalibrated. Thank you. You did. Um, where I hope to enter, <laughs> what I hope um, my work can help us understand is not only better understand the work of contemporary queer and trans rappers, especially black queer and trans rappers, um, but to situate them within the lineage of hip hop and also longer histories of black queer music practices. Um, so one of the goals I had of my book was to disabuse us of the notion that being queer and or trans and being hip hop are mutually exclusive. And um, this is, again, not to discount that there is homophobia, there is transphobia and queerphobia in hip hop, but to rather challenge the notion that it's more so or that it's inherent in this genre in a way that we don't encounter in other cultural practices, right? Um, and one of the ways I want to do that is to get us to think about how this notion developed, um, because again, it's not inherent, right? And so what were the, what was the context in which this, this belief sort of evolved and how it did not preclude queer participation, right? Either historically or in a contemporary moment. Um, and for me, you know, I, I came to hip hop through queer artists primarily. Um, you know, I'm of the generation where hip hop was pretty much part of my everyday sonic uh, soundscape um, as a as a kid growing up in the late 80s and the 90s. <laughs> Sorry, um, it wasn't something it wasn't something that was super prominent in my household, but certainly in my community. Um, but it's not something that I particularly identified with until I was in college and encountered queer and trans artists. Um, and so for me, kind of coming to terms with my queer identity coincided with me coming to terms with what are my musical interests outside of, you know, what I sort of was raised with, which was quite eclectic. Um, I will say that, though. Um, so I was seeing and hearing artists like Goddess and She, who are from Southeast Michigan, <laughs> right, at queer focused events, right? Not necessarily hip hop focused events, but queer focused events. Um, and they appeared on the original L Word around that time, which was a big deal, um, et cetera, et cetera. I was going to say some lyrics, but I won't. I won't. All the back, all the back, all the back, all the back. They did lick. That was like my jam, too. But no, they did lick it. Lick it. I lick it. I guess we'll go there later. We'll go there. We'll go there. We'll go there. Let's. <laughs> Um, and then when I was working on my master's thesis on women's music and doing field work at the now defunct Michigan Women's Music Festival, um, by that point, they had a dedicated day stage, not an evening stage, mind you, it was relegated to a day stage, um, but a whole day stage dedicated to hip hop performers, right? 
So I was seeing folks like Medusa, um, Your Majesty, uh, Raina Williams, uh, Skem, Korean American rapper, Jin Ro, right? Yeah. And, and it kind of blew my mind because the messaging I had gotten was that hip hop is, it's so homophobic. It's ho so misogynistic. It's all these things. And yet there's all these queer women rapping about loving ladies. <laughs> and it kind of was like, okay, so that, that really changed my relationship to the genre. So I came to hip hop, not as someone trying to, you know, reconcile in that direction, but as someone who because of queer artists, right? That's that's how I came to it. Um, and then so if I think about what, happened, what happens during the 2000s and the 2010s is our sort of political and legal landscape shifts drastically in the U.S. for queer folks, uh, white, cis, queer folks especially, right? Um, and so with that also came sort of um, increased visibility of queer art, trans artists um, in the mainstream. Um, but what I found really frustrating about that is if and when there was media coverage, it would point out one or two rappers and be like, this is a brand new thing. There's a, a gay rapper or two gay rappers. This has never happened before in the history of rap ever. Um, and so every couple of years, people would say that about a new artist, right? Um, and, and it's frustrating because while I really want us to, to celebrate and acknowledge these artists, um, it, it divorces them from these longer histories, right? It, continues to marginalize queer and trans participants in hip hop by sort of siloing them and situating them outside of the longer historical context, right? Um, and so, you know, I wanted to push back on that. I want, what if we didn't think of queer and trans rappers as marginal? What if we didn't think of them as something like outside of hip hop's core? What if we repositioned them as being there from the beginning um, and think about how they shaped hip hop, right? And so most of my work is focused on contemporary artists um, I do consider sort of early hip hop's development and especially the overlap between black queer musical spaces and musical practices and early hip hop. Um, and Shantae does his work much more in depth than I do. And I'm really indebted to your work in thinking about those things. Um, but then I also think about how are contemporary rappers engaging with ideas of blackness and queerness that are distinct to them? distinct to their particular communities, right? Because again, I want to acknowledge that they're queer and trans and they articulate that in their music, but they're all very different, right? We have different geographical pockets. They're engaging with different traditions. Um, and so I'm considering, okay, what is this particular artist's background? Are they a member of the ballroom community? Is that coming through in their music or in their lyrics and their visuals, right? Um, Sissy Bounce rappers, obviously very distinct sound and gestures, right? And thinking about dance's relationship um, to that. And to that, I'm very indebted to Amani's work and thinking about that relationship too. Um, and as a musicologist and ethnomusicologist, I am really attentive to sound. Um, and by that, I don't want to suggest that there's something that's uh, an inherently queer sound. I'm thinking about um, especially the work of folks like... Um, Nadine Hobbs, who's written about this group of gay American modernist composers in mid 20th century. And one of the things she argues is that they embrace similar aesthetics, not because they were inherently gay, but because they were part of a shared community because of their queer identity. Right. And so they're circulating these aesthetics. Um, and that is part of who they are. And we hear that in the music, not because it's inherently queer, but because of the sort of social milieu in which they were traveling. And so I want to think about that in terms of hip hop. What are some of the distinct sonic markers that queer artists might be using um, that we should understand in order to better understand their work and better situate them? Um, so I think I'll stop there. But uh, this is just I'm so delighted to, <laughs> to be here. Shantae. Thank you so, thank you so much, Elliot and uh, University of Minnesota for bringing us all here. I just want to say just uh, thank you, Elliot, for curating this panel. I think this the constitution of this panel is very different than it might have been 10, 15, certainly 50 years ago, um, right? Not only for uh, those of us who are, everyone on this panel is either, you know, non-binary or um, assigned female at birth or woman, um, there are elemental differences. So we've got dance, 
represented. We've got graffiti represented, as well as music and music history. Um, it's kind of you know, there's racial differentiation, regional. Um, and uh, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness. Um, and I just want to also just shout out uh, Regina Bradley, who wasn't able to be here today for really writing about outcast, but also this U.S. South's importance, so vital, and and really for the last twenty years um, has been has has dominated uh, hip hop aesthetics broadly, not just sonically, but visually, and really uh, opened the doors. I would even argue for the dominance of women in hip hop currently. A lot of them are coming from the South or using kind of the aesthetics from that uh, wide regional culture. So I think, you know, this question is so great. First of all, I was I was coming here and I was like the biggie lyrics, you know, remember rapping Duke, da ha, da ha, whoever thought hip hop would take it that far. Now we're, you know, so like hip hop is 50 birthday. You know, some people are arguing, some people are like, well, we're, we're, I'm like, okay, you know what? We're going to take it. We're going to take it. Yeah, 50-ish. We're going to take it. Yeah, we're going to, we're going to take, we're going to take this this party that Cindy and Clive Campbell threw on August 11th, 1973, 50, 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the Bronx, New York, as a kind of coalescing point, right, of something that was brewing at least for um, uh, a while. And I, you know, I want to just like mark these three identities that I inhabit in relationship to hip hop. One is, first one is a fan. So, I, you know, I tell the story, I write about it, but, you know, I heard, this is what I remember. It's probably not factually accurate, but I think it's relatively accurate, which is that my mom was taking me to see Dream Girls on Broadway. I was a baby. I don't know how I was like, I need to see Dream Girls, but okay. And my older cousin put on a Curtis Blow out record. And I was like, what is that? So um, hip hop is my older sibling. Um, it really raised me. By the time I was seven, eight, I had a little name, Small Fry, a nameplate belt, PR Cardan, vo like velvet suit, um, Adidas, blue and yellow Adidas. Had my cardboard that I took around and um, break dance was break little break dancer on the corner making ciphers, beatbox ciphers with my older cousins. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, for, so it really raised me. Like you know, it was a it was an older family member. Older, I looked to the culture not only for the music, but for language, for knowledge, for fashion, for trends. So, back then when we had all those magazines, you know, I'd have the um, Tiger Beat and whatever. And then later when the television shows evolved, the Basement. Um, Yo MTV raps, you know, later, 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 106 in Park. So those things were so important to learn how to dance, um, show off your moves at a little basement party, you know, um, and argue about your favorite crews or uh, who was better, the Bronx, Queens, Manhattan, you know, Brooklyn, to that island in parentheses, we don't really care. Um, sorry, sorry, SI. Um, sorry, sorry, Staten Island. Sorry, sorry, I, sorry, Staten Island. Side Staten Alley, you know, I'm from Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> we we just the island so much, sorry. But they gave us the woo, so, you know. Um, and then, of course, the regional. So first, really, as a fan and as a kind of um, student of hip-hop, I remember my older brother introduced me to this rapper from San Francisco, Paris. I don't know if y'all remember Paris, but Paris was like a five percenter, like a new Black Panther. And like I learned about the tenets of Black Panthers through Paris, through listening to Paris, right? Or the era of hip hop music and uh, sound that was then the earlier era. We're back to it now. That was uh, commingling with house music. So Jungle Brothers and Queen Latifah and, uh, you know, Native Tongues and and also um, the whole Afrocentric period of hip hop. And I was talking to someone, I was like, yeah, maybe people look back, why were we wearing like Africa, you know, medallions and red, black, and green? But that was so important. I learned a lot about um, black diasporic history through hip hop. Um, and there, there are some good books on the uh, Muslim and 5% five percenter influence on hip hop and how many Muslim slash 5%er slash black Israelites are, were foundational to hip hop. So I learned a lot about black history 
critical race theory, whatever, through rappers, you know, as much as you, you know, there were rappers who talked about street life or whatever, there was also, you know, um, Knowledge Reign Supreme One, you know, KRS One. So this idea of knowledge being so important. So as a fan, and then that led me to think that I could be an art rapper. So I was, I had a group, I had a couple of groups and I was a rapper and I, we made some albums and I toured, I, you know, so I know all Jen Rowe, Goddess. I declined Michigan Women's Festival because of their anti-trans policies at the time. But, um, but then learning so much about the form through performing, and that's what led me to want to go to graduate school and learn more about uh, the long history. So just thinking about the fact that we have things like we have uh, hip hop scholarly journals, the, there's a hip hop museum being built. Um, we have conferences where we have panels like this. There are university fellowships. There are classes. I teach a class. I've met, all of us teach classes on hip hop. You know, um, I'm teaching a grad class right now on hip hop aesthetics. We're going on a graffiti tour on Sunday in uh, the, the East and West Village. So the fact that it's become something that is not only a multi-billion dollar industry, but also a site of multiple sites of knowledge making, know-how, making, doing, um, and thinking. Um, this a critical uh, philosophical aspect to, um, I feel like hip hop has been a, a philosophy. Um, and a, a, a critical modality for living, not just something I consume, right? And not something that's disposable. So it's very interesting as aging, right? I'm a Gen Xer. So it's very interesting aging hip hop. And, you know, some of the music now is not for my ears. It's not for my old ears. Like one of my students, I remember we were like doing a music exchange and he was like, here, you know, how about young MBA? Young, what's the young MBA? And I was like, okay, yeah. And then I was like, young MBA, young. And I was like, mm. Okay. And he's like, you didn't like it? I was like, well, I'm like a lyrics person. So, and then I gave him like a Rhapsody. And he was like, oh, that was really dope. And so I was like, yeah, I like lyrics, complex rhyme schemes, you know, whatever. But I was like, this is important that there are different kinds of modalities. So I think those kinds of conversations, um, there are at least three generations of hip hop heads, um, maybe more, maybe four which is really amazing. You know, people in their 70s down to, you know, kids. My, you know, my, when I always laugh, my older brother, like, um, has my 10-year-old niece as a Wu-Tang. <laughs> so Wu-Tang is for the children. And Zing is for the children. So I think that I um, feel that I'm in uh, a, a cadre of, of scholars and artists who have really benefited from the foundations of hip-hop and who are able to um, push some, um, uh, think about it as this like kind of um, conceptually and, and you know, sort of materially as something that has a lot of roots, like a tree that has an incredible amount of roots. And there are some that are more prominent, but um, that uh, the fact that there are queer, trans, MCs, dancers, um, writers, um, DJs, right? The all the influences of hip hop, early hip hop, not just you know Jamaican, you know Caribbean sound systems, but disco, um, uh, mainly <laughs> funk, right? I mean, disco is the first hit was actually. So I was remembering the first hit was. Um, Sugar Hill Gang, right? Using Sheik's Good Times, not as a sample, but the entire song. Now Rogers talks about this. But then I remembered, I was re just remember reminding myself that uh, Curtis Blow was the first rapper signed to a major label, Mercury. Does Mercury Records still exist? No. Signed to Mercury Records, and his first album was a Christmas album. So hip hop also has, the music also has this aspect of kind of, um, camp you know and then you know I always listen to of course the Run DMC's uh it's Christmas at Hollis Queens mama's cooking um chicken and collard greens thank you I was like pork no she ain't cooking pork so we're here um and um 
I just want to mention a couple of artists. So one, I want to shout out my boy Tori Fix, who's a Minneapolis-based producer and DJ, um, uh, who was really foundational in early LGBTQ, like early meaning nineties, um, uh, push of those like explosion of uh, of queer artists. Um, he was part of this group called Rainbow Flavor. Okay, you know whatever. Um, which ended up producing some of the most important kind of producers and cultural um, Svengali's of early uh, 90s queer hip hop. So Juba Kalamka, who ended up going to form Deep Dick Collective out in California. Um, Judge Muscat, Dutch Boy, who, you know, we he formed Fat Family Records, which was a queer um, LGBTQ hip hop record label. We had a group together called BQE. And then Tori Fix produced for a whole bunch of people, including Jen Rowe and Johnny Dangerous and many, many, many people. And then I also want to shout out a contemporary trans um, black uh, Dominican woman named um, Miss Boogie, who's from New York, who's been on, you know, records with um, Jungle Pussy and all these other cool people who's, uh, whose album I think is out. So you should you should definitely look her up, um, Miss Boogie. Um, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's all I want to say for you. Thank you. So thank you so much. We're we're gonna we're gonna have a kind of conversation that I'm gonna sort of lead and moderate, um, and then we're gonna go to Q and A after that. Um, I I, I want to give another shout out to really sort of Regina Bradley, right? Who you know sort of could not be here um, for tonight's event. Um, and and one of the things that um, I think she tweeted or posted on Facebook or s some some sort of social media platform. Um, and I was really curious. I didn't have a chance to kind of ask her what was the impetus for this. Um, but, you know, 50th anniversary of hip hop. And it was very much like her post was, you know, love all these retrospectives, but we need more women. We need more LGBTQ plus folks. And we need more attention on spaces that aren't simply sort of New York City. Right. As great as New York is. Um, and, and I remember being like texting, you know, Regina, I was like, Hey, I'm about to send you an email. That's really about that thing that you just are talking about. Um, and that was the kind of invitation for sort of you all. And so I'm so happy that you could be here. Um, I, I have a, a series of, of questions just based off of what you all just said and, and for the audience, both here and presently, but also virtually. None of these, I, I didn't read any of these things ahead of time, right? So like these are kind of, these are kind of things that i'm I'm thinking about in real time um that that I think really really struck me uh, and hearing you all uh, talk about your work, talk about your identities and how it's tied to hip hop. and I, I want to go um to something shante that 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 you mentioned, but Jess, you also mentioned we all kind of talked about it a little bit. Um, this notion around the pedagogical promise of hip hop, right? What we learn through hip hop, right? And I, I'm curious if you all could uh, do two things. One is to expand more on what hip hop has taught you. You can answer that personally, you can answer that professionally, what hip hop has taught you. But I'm also curious for your students, right? We all, as you said, teach hip hop classes, right? Also make a shout out for, I don't know if there, I, I can't really see because it's a little dark in here even the lights are on me. Uh, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna plug a class that I'm teaching in the spring. I'm teaching a queer uh, and really feminist hip hop class in the spring. Um, and so I'm soap, I'm super excited to, to actually do that as well. Um, but I'm, I'm curious about what also your students have taught you about hip hop, right? So what has hip hop taught you? And then what have your students taught you? Yeah, so what has hip hop more broadly as a genre, as a culture taught you? And then what have your students taught you within the classroom about hip hop? I think for me, I think for me, the element of, you know, the five elements of hip hop, right? Um, DJ, MC, and B boy, and B girl, and B them, and um, uh, graffiti, and knowledge. So knowledge for me has been the most important one, often forgotten, to seek knowledge, to be teachable, to be in community, to both 
um, this idea of I was, when Amani was talking about the cipher, the cipher as a, as a main aspect of hip hop culture, um, because it's an Africanist aesthetic, the cipher in rapping, the cipher in dancing, right? Um, and so this idea of also the shout out and referencing people, right? So this idea of like lineage is so important. This idea of being connected um, and, and as much because there's competition and all that's ego, right? Informed by like capitalism and just being a human being, there's also collaboration and um, crews, you know? So I think this idea of being part of a crew and being like collaborative and learning is like being curious, like that's a, and um, is really, you know, important. I think of like, uh, I went to this really great panel in July or August that was about, um, uh, it was talking about, it was mostly, it was focused on dancers. So like um, Rockefeller, you know, was this amazing um, dancer. Uh, and then there was another dancer from Philadelphia. And then there was a young uh, rapper. She was from the Bronx and it was like in a really amazing panel. And I just kept thinking about how important it is to be, stay connected, you know, to community. In terms of what my students have taught me so much, you know, I think that um, one of the main things they've taught me is uh, how much they uh, kind of see themselves as, I don't know exactly, the word. they see themselves as part of hip hop community, but they, um, they just need a little bit of permission to be makers. And so they've taught me a lot about the value of like being like um, kind of green and vulnerable and tender in relationship to it. And it's, a, it's a, another form of curiosity and and also how much fun you can have, right? You know, like I, I come from like more of a generation slightly serious, like, oh yeah, hip hop is ripped. You know, we take our craft seriously, yeah, yeah. But also there's like a lot of fun, right? So they've taught me to they remind me to have fun. And also the joy talking about things we love and learning more about aspects that we love. Um, so uh, I have a, a one student who say she, she said that told me yesterday that for her final project, she's a cellist. And so she wants to like compose, uh, do cello composures of all these hip hop songs. And I was like, wake up. So yeah. Hip hop taught me how to do ethnographic research. Um, at the very beginnings of my project, one of the reasons I didn't want to do it is because I had to talk to strangers. I don't like that. <laughs> I'm very introverted. Um, so that was incredibly daunting. And it taught me how to how to talk to people, how to roll up on complete strangers and like dive in about what it is they do. Um, and in fact, I have two articles in the anthology I co-edited that are about uh, ethnographic research. One is about uh, the corporealities of women identified ethnographers of hip hop dances. And um, the other is on critical hip hopography and kind of what their perspectives lend to thinking about what that means and what that looks like. So on just a basic, because, you know, there's certain differences. So, you know, the academy is like, you get to your research side, you you pay attention, you take notes, you, you know, get the thing signed, so you get permission to record and da 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 da. And when you're there, folks like sign in the I don't even know you. Like, what is that? Let me see what you do with my information before I sign anything. No, you can't record. Just pay real close attention. Let me see what you do do with the information. You get that way. And if you're in a cipher and you got a notebook, you're not in a cipher anymore. Not only can you are you not connected, but yeah. something down and then a look up and there are like three people in front of me all of a sudden and I'm not tall so that makes a difference mm -hmm. so like I learned how to be how to be in that space how to absorb and take in because it's an oral history driven culture that's what you do that's what all the practitioners are doing like oh and elders talking about their experiences all these battles that they used to be at people are going to sit and they're going to pay close attention and they're going to draw on information they had so all of that was like how I learned and it was it was better it was better for me it was better for me in that space um and I realized that that was a, a thing that I needed that I needed that um wasn't organic in the academy 
it was another moment that it was uh, one among many moments that reminded me that when we talk about the relationship between hip hop and the academy and something like hip hop studies, it's not just about bringing hip hop into the academy. It's way the academy itself needs to shift and change in order for that to even be worth hip hop's while because they don't need the academy in the same way. So it, there's all of that was kind of there's just a lot in the experience of doing the research that taught me how to be um, in a way that I didn't have to lean on my professional training to give me some sort of identity. And that was helpful. I am a scholar. I identify as a scholar, but um, I, I want I, that relationship to hip hop necessitates a different relationship to the academy. And I appreciate that. Um, and then in terms of my students, like my, my actual students in classes, I mean, not only do they keep me up to date, and I'm, I'm so not up to date. Like, I'm happily old school in my appreciation of music. You talk about new people, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know how to identify who you're talking about. You have to, just, like, literally, like, listen to this song, and I'll be, oh, okay. So, and and I and I own that. But um, my students not only introduce me to things, they give me an indication of, like, what's new in the world. They also... They became a new audience in the process of finishing the book. And I feel like my audiences in the book are very broad and very different from each other, which was one of the challenges of finishing because I always had people in mind like my students for whom they have this relationship to hip hop. They don't always know how to identify it because it's, a, you know, I'm in a dance department. So it's dancers, people who dance. It's the parts of hip-hop dance that even hip-hop dance ignores so something like hip-hop choreo which is a lot of uh dance groups on can't college campuses they were trying to figure out what is their relationship to hip-hop culture because they didn't always articulate themselves in in relationship to hip-hop history even though they use that language there's movement involved but they don't know where it's coming from they're historicizing their own choreo traditions but not the 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 historical figures the 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 events that gate that shape them so something like the fly girls and how few people write on that and that's in the anthology or um just you know just where these things come from but recognizing in that process like this is something they also feel deeply that shapes who they are and how they identify in the world so i needed to i needed to or i realized i needed to make space for them too to offer enough of an understanding for them to feel like I'm talking to them and then fill in some of the blanks that I know they need and help kind of cultivate the kinds of questions you can ask that don't um, disregard your own relationship to the thing, but give room to enter and learn more. Um, so I, I feel like from my students, what I, I, I am continually learning a more expansive way to engage their relationship to hip hop, to not um, discount it just because it's very different from mine, especially when it's increasingly like social media driven, but in a way that loops back around to a lot of the things I'm interested in, in spirit and connection and just in a different way. Okay. Um, so <laughs> I'm still, I have little notes here about cringing at their music. Um, when thinking about what I've learned from my students, I love them. They also keep me up to date, even through like the ways that I resist it. Um, I created a, a assignment for them to make me a playlist in one of my classes because I was like determined to like get with it. I am not with it. And that's, that's okay. Like I try, right? We try, we try, but I am like, if, you know, I I'm sorry, I am firmly in the land of like salt and pepper, queen of the sea, but like, that's my place. That's my happy place. And, and I feel like that's okay because I study graffiti. Um, so I don't have to know all the new names, right? I'm okay. Um, but okay. So aside from like that part, I think the thing that, um, I, 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 does this count as something that I learned from them? The importance of teaching the historical part um, that, uh, you know, to talk about Cardi B and Maggie Thee Stallion scissoring, maybe we need to go back, right? Yeah, I said it. Um, oh, 
maybe we need to go back and uh, like look at how sexuality was dealt with by again like salt and pepper right um which leads me to like what hip-hop taught me which i think the first thing i thought about was um sexuality but but a kind of um aggressive sexuality i guess that's that was not tied to like a promiscuity or a respectability politic, a, a kind of like this is my body kind of thing, um, a, a kind of feminism before I knew it was a feminist, before I knew what they were doing was feminist. Um, and then as like a scholar, um, I want to say, you know, that what my comments for today this was the first time I really thought about because now that I'm working more in Puerto Rican studies and thinking more about imperialism and colonialism and right all of those things um, in a way that I hadn't to to the to an extent before. I'm really how much I learned from studying what they did, even if it was not in the realm of what I thought I was studying, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, shout out Imani for ha also teaching me about hip hop ethnography, right? Like, she was my teacher, um, <laughs> literally. Um, and and you know, so thinking about um, ethnography, you know, I, I mark it as like a queer feminist hip hop ethnography. It's not extractive. It's about relation. Uh, I, I try to make it a point as much as I can to sort of. Uh, give back or shout out or par participate because I am not a writer, right? I, and I'm an outsider who was given some insider privileges, right? And <laughs> I remember the first time I had to do human subjects, uh, right? Like when you interview people, you know, these institutions, they have to cover their butts. So they make you do all this paperwork. And I was like, they're not going to write their legal names on these documents. I was like, they're going to tag them and that's going to be fine. And so now I have, you know, like <laughs> I got Lady Pink's tag on like an IRB form. Right. Um, and and so, you know, it, it's it's I don't know. I feel like they taught me about rebellion. I feel like they taught me about um, being about it, which is a phrase I got from Claw Money. Um, and uh, depending on where, you know, because my book is not just the US, it's like over 20 countries. And no, I didn't get to go to all of them, but I did get to go to a lot of them. But we have the internet, so I was able to make connections in that way. They taught me also to be wary of purity politics in hip hop, which I'm gonna, you know, like when you were doing the thing about Staten Island, I was like, oh, shall they? Oh, and that, that, that. Because my original, you know, my first like, the girls that I that I learned from and paid attention to were New York girls. And those girls don't play. You know, they have rules and regulations. But then when I would move into other places, particularly in Global South, those were not the same rules or regulations. And so I had to then adjust lots of what I knew about feminism, about hip hop to to make space for like how they were doing what they were doing. So I don't know. Hip hip hop taught me everything. It's for everybody. I think uh, for me, hip hop, two really big lessons I've taken from hip hop and from studying hip hop in the way I do is what a productive refusal of respectability politics might look like and thinking about how I might carry that into the academy with me. Um, and the other thing is that it's really forced me to interrogate my relationship to whiteness in a way that my formal study did not make me do or prepare me to do. Um, you know, I identify as queer and then that since working with openly identified queer and trans artists, I, that resonates with me and I identify with that. That's really important to me. But it's also important that I identify as white and not ignore that and how that shapes uh, our relationships while at the same time not identifying with whiteness the way it's constructed in our culture and through studying hip-hop and engaging with artists and even doing like close readings of other texts even if I'm not doing ethnography that's always something that I need to be aware of that again was not part of my formal education I'm a classically trained musician I never had to question whiteness <laughs> in that space right 
Um, in terms of my students, I, I teach at a PWI. And when I teach hip hop, I'm teaching predominantly white classes. And I'm in the school of music, so I get maybe a couple of students who really come in with the knowledge of hip hop. Most of them don't. And I think what I've learned in that process is that we have a lot of power to reshape those narratives that we're challenging because some of them are a blank slate. And so if I tell them hip hop's roots are in black girls, you know, jump rope games, uh, shout out to Kira Gott. They believe that moving forward and then they go to step shows and they're like, oh, look, that's also hip hop, which just happened to me this past week. Right. Yeah. And so I, that comes with a lot of responsibility, but it also is really hopeful, I think, because, you know, when we we look at all of these new television shows coming out and the continued focus on men and cishet men. And when we're in the classroom, we have the power to change that. Right. And I think that's what my students taught me above all. Thank you. I'm 10 minutes. OK, this is this is I mean, listen, time is going by really fast. This is this is actually great um, because in these last 10 minutes, I wanted and, and it's basically sort of all of your all of your responses right now. Right. I've been thinking about sort of the present day kind of landscape. Um, I, I, and I, so I'm going to ask these questions at the same time, since we only have 10 minutes is to, we've been doing shout outs, which is a very hip hop thing, right? Throughout this event. Um, and I would be, you know, remiss for me at least if I didn't also think about those in hip hop in the past 50 years who aren't with us anymore, right? And I, 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 I want to ask if you all could talk, if, if you want to, right? You don't have to. But I know for a lot of us doing this work that we've been doing for so many years, there are folks who are just not with us anymore. And I wanted to kind of, in thinking about hip hop, those who might have been key to our work but aren't here anymore, I actually wanted to kind of open up space for that. Um, and, and then to, to kind of end on a perhaps more uplifting note, is to also talk about how you want to envision the future of hip hop, right? So it's a two part question, one that's thinking about the past, right? And those who have passed on and then thinking about the future and how you kind of envision a, a future of hip hop. Okay, hard question. And what hard question? <laughs> I don't, uh, oh, huge response. But I mean, it's, I don't know how to answer that question. I can't kind of attend to it in a, for me personally, I can't attend to it as a, oh, this person who's not with us really shaped what the project became. It's more like I walked into this project um, being made aware of who was no longer there. So like when I started my field research in the mid 2000s, it was just after Skeeter Rabbit passed, not too long, I guess. I'm not quite sure the time frame. All I know is his name was very much in the air. I never met him. Um, he's in uh, the Freshest Kids documentary. So if anybody's ever seen the Freshest Kids, Freshest Kids, a documentary about the history of breaking, kind of. Um, he's in there and he's explaining the different genres of popping. So he's coming out of California. And uh, that was already quite palpable. And as the years progressed, like I remember seeing Frosty Freeze and being way too intimidated to talk to this man. And then he passed and it was just like, Shh. like, and that is a thing that happens. Um, during COVID, we lost so many people that are important to hip hop and many pioneers in hip hop bands. And the first two that come to mind are Don Campbell, who innovated locking and Tyrone Proctor, who innovated whacking. And so it's, it's people who were so impactful to the culture that I was learning from and about who were gone that you have a developing responsibility to. Um, and the people who I've interviewed, naming people who shaped their world, who had passed on. So then I had a responsibility to those folks too. It was it was it was more along those lines. I'm forgetting the second part of your question. 
uh, it, which is which is it's more about the future of hip hop. How do you think, theorize, envision future of hip hop uh, through, through dance or through sort of other sets of means as well? For me, the future, uh, just coming off of you know the question you asked, the future then is about moving forward, but like with that responsibility in tow, with those communities in tow. Um, with those lessons in tow, like they don't go away, but it's also then, you know, about making room for the thing that I can't predict or name what it's going to be, but like fortifying yourself in order to improvise whatever the what next is. Like nobody predicted COVID. So how do you improvise through that? Dance has been really, really key in teaching me that because it's a dynamic with the environment, sonic environment, but like how you move and how you move through and how you move through with. And that's fundamentally what people are always kind of doing and activating in those spaces and spending time with dancers who experiment in and through that or who take up these responsibilities in different ways. Like you might hear a, a brief sonic reference, a sample that allows somebody to embody a particular gesture and that's their way of paying homage while they're also moving through. Like it's it's recognizing why these histories, these foundations, these especially histories that haven't been documented yet, why they matter, because the forward is the forward is forward. But the more equipped you are, the more schooled you are, the more skilled you are, you can improvise in the smallest circle, in the most expansive way, in the most forward thinking way, because of what has built you up. All right. Um, yeah, agreed. Hard. Um, <laughs> you know, when you were you posed the question, my so Jose Munoz was my dissertation advisor, and he was the first person that came to mind when he asked the question, not because he's an important figure in hip hop, um, but because he was. Well, because he was my advisor <laughs> when I was working on the dissertation, right? Um, he was the one that believed in my project. And um, he was also the one who taught me that writing about graffiti girls and hyping them up also included critiquing them. Um, and I, I remember the first exclamation part, you know, like like he would review my papers. I would go in and he would read it in front of me. And it was like this super intimidating thing. Um, and then sometimes he would write things. And my first exclamation point I ever got, um, where it said good, was where I was talking about like a terrible mural. Right. <laughs> I was writing about um, a, an organization in Brazil, Ferinami, um, that uses graffiti to teach uh, girls and women in favelas about legislation around intimate partner violence, sexual violence, stuff, stuff like that. And, you know, when you're learning graffiti, you're bad. You're you're bad at it. And it's okay to say it's bad. And so I, I thought about Jose, and then I thought about, like, bell hooks, right? I thought um, about how her Black feminist scholarship, even though I didn't agree with all, all the things that she said in relationship to, to hip-hop, in relationship to expressions of masculinity, it was still super formative um, to me. And then when I think about practitioners, you know, um, I mentioned ACB in my in my talk that Pink painted her in. I never met her. When I started doing my work, she was already like a legend. She had already passed. I feel like she passed from breast cancer. and But she was known as a kind of convener of girls in the scene. And people were like, oh, you heard a lot of ACB, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, and then right before we started today, uh, Shantae asked me about one of our shared interlocutors, Kid Lucky, um, who organized this event called Women of the Fifth. Um, I have no idea what year that was. I feel it was forever ago, um, but it was all all women beatboxers, right? Or people who identified as women that did beatboxing. Um, and he died right in the beginning of COVID and it was just like such a hectic time. And so um, bringing him into the space. Um, and so, okay, how do I bring all these people together to talk about futures? I, I, <laughs> I don't know. Um, 
But I, I will say that, you know, obviously as scholars, Munoz and Hooks were both interested in a better future, right? A more accurate accounting, a, a, you know, um, a kind of moving towards something different. And I think that, you know, I could say that about Kid Lucky too, right? Like putting together an event that was just women in beatboxing was like a big, it was a big deal. How, it would be a big deal now, Right. It was a while ago when we were just talking about how there hasn't been much movement in beatboxing. But I feel like um, one of the things that I really want to express just in general is just the, the, the sentiment that a lot of those early hip hoppers or a lot of the hip hoppers that chose a, a, a different path, a third way, we don't remember their names. And then when they pass, um, either right, like someone we try to recoup or they just go unheard. So again, so just going back to, I think it's important for us to, to try to, to use that space <laughs> of the classroom um, to bring in these names, these people who are not like in the news headlines, they're not billionaires, right? And to point out that like hip hop <laughs> came about because of the conditions under which these people were living and those conditions really haven't shifted, right? So that's all I In terms of loss, I immediately think about how many folks in the New Orleans community I would never get to meet or talk to about my project. Um, Nikki to be, for example, who uh, collaborated with Diplo is one of the first to uh, bring bounce and the specifically bounces sort of queer and trans iterations to a broader audience through that sort of mainstream collaboration um, who passed before I started my project. Um, and folks like Messi Maya, who was credited, not credit, sorry, sampled, uncredited initially in Beyonce's formation. Um, and so other folks in that community that um, are grappling with, you know, a combination of community violence, but also um, neglect and disparities, right? In terms of healthcare, in terms of economic resources, things like that. Um, my project could have been different if I could talk to other folks or it may have been greatly enhanced, I could say that. Um, in terms of looking in the future, I've been thinking a lot lately about Lil Nas X. I'm not about to say he's like the future, but <laughs> the thing that interests me about Lil Nas X is how old he makes me feel. <laughs> because, and by that, I mean, there's a generational shift happening, right? And I, I'm really curious to see, we have all this rhetoric about you know, Gen Z being much more um, open to different uh, genders and sexualities. And I'm curious to see how that's going to continue to shape the genre. I'm not making any predictions. I mean, we still have major labels getting involved, which messes things up sometimes. Um, but I, I do see a sort of playfulness in him. And I, I, I want to understand that better, right? Um, I want to understand that better. And I, I think that there's the, you get to a moment where you're like I'm up on what's happening, and then all of a sudden you you're not, <laughs> right? I like I think I'm right there. <laughs> I'm right. Well, yeah, I'm I'm joined. I've joined you. I've joined you. Um, but I'm curious to see how just overall generational trends are going to impact um, hip hop, both mainstream and not as mainstream, moving forward. Um, thank you. Okay, that, no, I have um, Boyz II Men's It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday, Plain Man. Anyway, it's, uh, I think, you know, it's called Hip Hop Tourette's, but um, there are so many people. I think it, broadly, I want to just say all the people, hip hoppers, we lost to AIDS related complications, crack, um, incarceration, uh, mental health. It's just, it's in fact it's unfathomable and um all the uh these gen x black men in their early 50s dying like it's been it's been devastating um like uh, yeah it's been really really like uh, my brother and i talking about this because he's like 50 and we're like what you know and um so young young um so uh, that's that's um, lingering 
uh, with me, as well as uh, you know, I was just I just had this flash of when um, Left Eye died, and I was thinking about all these really talented artists from the '90s and early 2000s who either some of them are having some res resurgence, but just yeah, this how that impacted you know people like Aaliyah, who wasn't a rapper but so important to hip hop. Um, and how, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, Biggie and Pac, but just thinking about how important sonically Aaliyah w it was to hip hop and to the career of someone like Timberland and Missy, you talk about Aaliyah. So, you know, b known and unknown. Um, and, and yeah, hoping that people are interested enough to write their stories or a part of their stories of those histories. And there's so many things to thinking about the future, I'm really interested in what elements are, are other elements of hip hop going to get more shine without being totally, okay, so I'm really interested to see about the Olympics next year, right? With breaking, right? I'm like, what's going to happen, right? What's going to happen, right? So like, you know, skateboarding now is a part of, you know, which is like, a part, you know, so I'm like, what's gonna, I'm really interested to see right? And I'm also really interested in uh, visual cultural aspects you know, of uh, hip hop culture, um, you know, graffiti, but also film and and you know, fine art is really there's really this fine art aspect now. So I'm I'm really interested in that, um, and I'm I'm wondering just what the next generation of hip hop scholars will do that includes music, but also beyond music. You know, I think that's really really important to keep it vibrant and also the global aspect. You know, seeing now as like Afro beat has become people see how amazing it is and hear how amazing it is. I'm really interested if there are going to be more venues open up for, you know, artists that a lot of us know or have met that are incredible um, and who aren't in the West or the global North. Um, and will there be venues for them to have broader, broader platforms? So these are just, these are questions. Uh, and also then formally, if there'll be space for us to do more experimental things like what A.D. Carson did, which is have a dissertation, which was a record, which is something I wanted to do. And, the, and they were like, no, you're already in performance studies. It's already weird. You're not going to get a job if you do that. So I'm looking, he's coming to my class uh, in a couple of weeks. So I'm interested to see if there'll be more ways of experimenting beyond the book or hybrid forms of, of knowledge. So thank you so much. We have hit the Q and A portion of the event, um, and to really kind of reiterate, to, to really sort of reiterate what Bianette said at the beginning, right? We're going to be using uh, Slido. Um, that is for also that was for it, it's for those who are who are watching virtually, but also those in person. Uh, and so there's a QR code, or you can go to Slido.com, use the event code Hip Hop uh, to submit your questions. They will appear on the screen for me, and then I will read those questions. So that that's the kind of format that we're going to have, right? So you be sort of, so basically, again, sort of use Slido either through the QR code, which is flashing on your screen. It feels like a QVC thing, um, right? So like you had, so that's the kind of thing, right? So uh, if you if you use Slido or go to Slido.com, again, infomercial, uh, use the code Hip Hop, submit your question. <laughs> Today, right, for nine ninety nine, you can ask us a question, right? Uh, so. Okay, I can't see. It's hard for me to see people. That's a great. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's the. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great that's a great question, right? So, uh, if if you don't have a if you don't have a phone, so yeah, uh, it, uh, I'm gonna ask if you have if you have a question. Then we have someone uh, who could also give you a microphone. Yeah. Okay. All right. A brief delay. I would. I do want to add. Uh, I mentioned in terms of people lost Kamal Rafa. It was someone we also lost during COVID. Um, and I would say he was the first. I learned a lot from him. He was ta learned talking about Caribbean cosmology embedded in cultural practice, and that was really what opened up my own work in hip hop. He was also the first person to ask me very seriously in class once. You know what does hip hop have to say about this? What would Biggie say? about that I was like, oh, so I, I want to add his names. Thank you. We do have a question on Slido. Um, are there any hip hop figures that resonate with you? Who's on your radar? 
Man, they only got... Yeah. I'm going to go real fast because my answer is remember what I said about not being with it. This is not me. But if you're into graffiti, I just cannot keep I few and far. That's the crew I was talking about. They're doing things. They're going on 12, 13 years. Um, they're the only one of the there are two all girl graffiti crews in the United States. Um one is PMS, based out of New York, right? We got Miss 17 Claw and Friends, but Few and Far. And Few and Far breaks the crew model because they're skateboarders, they're street artists. Um, they travel, they do so much. So that's who's on my radar. Well, um, off the top, we're, uh, No Name. No Name just dropped an awesome album. Um, but when we're talking about knowledge, she's running these book clubs and really investing in sharing knowledge, right? Making that accessible to folks, not necessarily through academic means, right? Like really expanding what we think of that. So no name is my number one right now. Tell me this. Oh yeah, hey, yes, yeah. I'm uh, really interested in the, um, uh, like some of the artist scholars. So they'll like come up to me and give me their Spotify page. At like a conference, so uh, or um, so I've been listening to a lot of like young, you know, people in college who are like um, studying hip hop, but also are artists. So that's a lot of SoundCloud rappers, and not as a diss, but like you know, um, and then you know, professors who are also artists, so uh, DJs and producers. So those are like you know some of the, but um, also yeah, No Name is one of my favorites, and Chica is also great. Oh, of course, Nas. Um, is like, is just killing the game still. And um, I just like super open to, uh, I really do love Megan Thee Stallion. I don't know, I just like love her so much. Um, so I love like being like, you know, just turned on to, but I, I'm listening to a lot of like R&B right now and a lot of like house music, like Katra Nanda and his, his um, uh, collaboration with, what's it, anime? What's the name, anime? An they caught an anime whatever they call it so they're it's a really great um album um and also black coffee is a great south african dj um and then who's not a rapper but uh duran bernard is someone and talk about a tiny desk that his tiny desk is so like i'm a musician and like a music person so listening to music that feels like it also influences my thinking about hip-hop but doesn't necessarily hip-hop music so. is what who we're listening to or what? Basically sort of who's on your radar. Who's on my radar for yeah. thought. Okay, so... I, yeah, it's a, it's, an, it's a challenging question for me to ask. I, I feel like, because it's typically more of a music question and I don't... I'm, I'm not the most up-to-date person. So, yeah, I don't know how to answer it in that way. <laughs> uh, I think the last hip-hop album I bought was Sampa the Great to spend time um because i had heard a couple of songs here and there and seen videos and the videos were kind of amazing to me but in terms of other types of hip-hop artists or practitioners or just hip-hop lovers who i pay attention to um d sabella grimes who is a dancer dance scholar practitioner um and professor in california i always pay attention to what he does his engagement with with movement with music he makes music he making doing video art now apparently and bringing all that together in his own choreographic practice and his own dance making i pay attention to anything he's doing i pay attention to full circle productions that's big girl rockefeller and big boy quick step um they do a lot of uh not only they perform on stage and things like that but they they do a lot of community-based work so i pay attention to what they're doing and how they're circulating in different communities through breaking um, I pay attention to a former student of mine who's also a friend of mine, Amanda Adams Louis. Uh, she goes by La Fotografus. And um, because she's doing a lot of really dope dance oriented things. So uh, bringing together old school house dancers to get, you know, for a panel of their oral histories or uh, it, finding and interviewing Kai Finkenstein, who wrote about like <laughs> underground dance music, but nobody's seen him for however. Um, 
and she's doing a thing now called sketching with street dancers. So engaging visual art, but purposely like trying to create space for people to actually have this relationship to dance. Because I think one of the reasons dance falls out of the discussion is that unless you're a dancer, people kind of assume that's not their place to speak. And it's hard to find words for this thing that is literally without them. Um, and so creating space for, for that to develop is a thing I pay attention to. And so in that respect, paying attention to um, how people are moving and operating in the world, there's B-Boy Why Not, who is moving his own kind of relationship to hip hop and thinking with and through hip hop to architecture. So I think that there's outside of music, um, because I feel like if you look at what I've recently purchased, <laughs> I don't feel particularly hip hop necessarily. Um, I'm paying attention to folks who are, who are just doing and being in the world in ways that I think activate hip hop in ways that I hadn't thought about before and that open up my own mind. Hey, thank you. Question up there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just a quick reminder, like, you know, uh, I challenge everyone to just keep in, uh, in, in in their front side of their brain. Like, you know, hip hop, we're operating strictly uh, from a community foundation. And I, I, I challenge, you know, even the university to keep that in mind as you're trying to move forward in community engagement. Uh, this is a rich discussion. Uh, let's uh, do more to promote and market into the community so that we can benefit from discussions like this. But to the two panelists on the right, um, I was closing my eyes and I was listening to your story around Curtis Blow and I, you know, that ha the same thing happened to me. And that's why I challenged you a little bit because it was at a block party in Staten Island with my family. And so obviously there's some similar themes there. And my sister, uh, I definitely looked at some of your work at UC Riverside because my father was a professor there before he transitioned. So, um, I did some research on your conference and everything. And so I do have more of a dance centered question. Um, coming back to some of your um, um, views on the Olympics. So what is it going to be like when this Olympics comes up in Paris? And you think about dance and the cipher and the connection to the ring shout and everything like that. Um, and the absolute attack on black men where you're seeing us disappearing through crack the unresolved issues around crack, the impact of black families, physical health, mental health, and otherwise. And then there's commodification of the black male image that continues to just go off the charts within what we call hip hop now. But what is it gonna be like, and anybody can an answer this question, when we look at Paris, um, France, and the breakdance uh, competition is in the Olympics and we don't see black men. Thank you for that question. It's an awesome question. Um, and I have, my, my brain is going in multiple directions, so I'm trying to figure out where to start. So I'm gonna hope it all comes together and say the pieces that are coming to mind. Uh, the first piece is that I'm a little bit of an Olympics hater. Yeah. So I just wanna preface that. Um, the second thing that comes to mind um, is the work of a friend of mine, Nicole Hodges Persley, she writes on hip hop theater and uh, one of her concepts is sampling blackness and the way that gesturally in, in a hip hop theater context, they're pulling from the way black men have performed hip hop, right? And I think that that's also true in dance in a lot of ways, especially dance that's moving in a more uh, staged choreographic direction. I say all that because the Olympics is a platform uh, that I think perpetuates a certain kind of erasure of blackness that we've seen historically through other cultural contexts like rock and roll, like jazz, where you appropriate it, you commodify it in a certain way, you circulate it as that thing so that it can sell and be marketed as this other thing. Things to pay attention to. The breaking in the Olympics was brought to the Olympics by a ballroom organization because they're trying to create space for ballroom in the Olympics. And they know that the appeal of the Olympics, that it's youth driven. No, the appeal of hip hop is that it's youth driven. So this will bring in new audiences. This is the Olympics trying to make itself relevant by taking up hip hop. So we have an organization that has no relationship to the community bringing this idea. And they're like, that's great. We should do this. And then they're facilitating it. No relationship to the community. 
then there's like a movement among breakers to at least intervene, interject, coordinate some sort of judging system that is respectful of the culture, which is to say like musicality matters. This is not just, you know, gymnastics with a hip hop background. Um, and then that eventually got scrapped. And so you just see a lot of problematic things. On the one hand, you have new avenues for younger practitioners to move through the world differently created by the Olympics. And so people are thinking about not just training, but training for this other platform. But then I remember watching a battle at the Junior Olympics. I watched the clip of a, of a battle at the Junior Olympics um, when breaking was first introduced. And it was so, super, it was so whack. Like, because, in part because if you think of breaking as just this visual spectacle, then music is accompanying it. If you recognize that there is an entire dynamic and music is co co uh, creative, co-choreographic in that space, and you put on whack beats because that's what you have copyright clearance for, produces whack dancing. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's things missing. They had the, the, the announcer, I was about to say MC. No, the announcer person who describes what's happening didn't know what the hell she was looking at. So it was just a lot of, that person knows what they're doing. Do you not know what you're doing? You've said nothing. You've offered nothing. So it just, look, it fell flat on so many levels. And it was just insulting. Like, this is whack. And you're going to teach whole generations that this whackness is like what it is. That's my hater side. My other side is like, but also... That's not the full of it. And anybody with any sensibility will recognize that. Even in a competition-driven version of breaking culture, people articulated, you might know how to battle in this context, but you don't even know how to cipher, which means you don't even know how to dance. So then people don't have respect. And that matters too. That plays into things as well. So I think there's going to, I mean, we've seen certain historical dynamics of erasure before and there's concern precisely because history repeats itself but i think there's room to also intervene to to it to let that that to let that monster eat itself continue to be whack please please because there's room for other things there's room for people to recognize there's something beautiful and dynamic here but we want the version that isn't just tricks we want to understand like we want the thing that can innovate new the trick version spectacle whatever doesn't innovate new it needs people to innovate new so that i can steal it and do something with it so i am trying to find a way to not feel defeatist because i don't it, it's not done it's not over but i also am comfortable being vocal about the fact that i don't, I don't think it's particularly a, a great thing that the olympics includes breaking now it could be it could also just continue to be whack. So I don't know. Okay. So unfortunately we have like five minutes left. <laughs> so, um, and I, I know time has completely gone by. Um, and w we have a series of questions um, to the person who asked about Asian artists and hip hop. I'm going to plug my book, <laughs> Sounds from the Other Side. Also plug Shantae's book, uh, you know, some hip hop heresies. Uh, for kind of information about the contributions of Asian Americans and Asian artists to hip hop. That's just throwing that out there, right? That was one of the questions that I would, and I hate to be that person about read my book, but also like, let's just, uh, I'm out. yes, right. Um, and so I'll combine two of these questions uh, to, to perhaps kind of see us out. Cause again, we only have now like four minutes. Um, one is about hip hop reshaping popular culture. And the other one is um, how you see social media reshaping hip hop for anybody in four minutes. I think uh, one of the things I just want to say, and this maybe is trying to pull in that last question, is thinking about the innovation of black folks and black aesthetics, uh, particularly in the U U black USAans, USAans um, um, maybe not benefiting the most as a group from the kinds of innovations we make and contribute contributions we make to the world globally um for last you know in terms of like um music cultures you know the last hundred plus years right but um i 
in, in terms of social media, all you know, almost all you know, when ninety percent of the dances trends from Black young people, right? They're figuring out how to organize and go on protests when they're getting shadow banned by TikTok and Instagram. Um, and so I think I think there's a kind of um, there is a kind of looking back at history and how Black artists, or Black makers, Black everyday people, Black communities have been extract our labor has been extracted um and uncompensated you know since our arrival on these shores um and there's a ref there's a refusal but there's also there's also like how we're one step ahead you know um so that's with social media but that's also with um just people experimenting with technology as we did you know with early hip-hop um and i and i think like uh yes i just want to i just want to say that um I, that, and i think like it's uh you know hip-hop is so um it has it's infused so much of global culture, you know. Not I mean, graffiti, you know, other places like graffiti is the thing, or like DJing is the thing, or dance. So um, it, it continues to. Uh, I just to say this one thing. I saw this video where they were people were kind of questioning. Um, I follow a lot of these black um, social media sites uh, where they were like there was an all, I think it was Korean um, step group, <laughs> and they were like they were like you know doing strolls from like Howard groups and you know from capitalism and all stuff and they were like but you know on one hand it's like the appropriation aspect and on the other hand it's like the depth and richness of black expressive culture black people the innovators of hip-hop need to also embrace that and remember that how rich our production and our communal um, aesthetic power is so i think about it like that That might actually be a great place for us to end. So thank you so much, all of you, for a fantastic day.